A new massive medieval grand strategy game just dropped, and you're wondering how to even get started and truly enjoy it. Well my friend, let's waste no time and get into how you can get off to a good start in Knights of Honor 2, and make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel if you found this video helpful. Knights of Honor 2 is a complex game that can be hard to understand right off the bat, so let's begin easy, and begin with a rather small faction to start with. I personally recommend beginning with a faction like Norway, but honestly, this is more about beginning small than anything. And this is important and a major feature of Knights of Honor 2 actually, because every faction's starting situation in terms of development is randomized. And I mean fully randomized. No two game will have you begin with the same manpower, workers, or resources. Only the starting location remains here. This is why beginning with a faction at the edge, and with a limited amount of provinces can be smart as it gives you a bit of a breather compared to beginning as the massive Germany or Byzantium. And so for sake of ease, how about we take a gander at Scotland, relatively isolated as it is located in the far northwest. First of all, it's important to get your bearings. As this is a sandbox game, and I cannot stress that enough, you begin every single game with no diplomatic relations, a virtually empty royal court, no cozy royal family, no traditions, no grand achievements, and yes, no buildings or even armies. This means that basically just apart from the starting locations, you are given a blank slate every time you begin, so don't worry if there's not much going on right away. Alright then, the first thing we need to pay attention to are our resources, ranging from gold, to books, religion, commerce, food, and kingdom levies. These are the values we need to maintain if we want to accomplish anything in this game, and raising them is always better than losing them. We often do begin with enough gold to get off the ground though, but using it correctly is important. In order to do so, we need to figure out how to get the best return on investment, and that leads us to our provinces. Every kingdom is made up of provinces, which in turn consists of a capital city and surrounding towns. We can only build things from the city panel, but what we build, upgrade, and how much we gain from it is actually influenced by the surrounding towns. These towns may for example be castles or farms, and they influence the value of your military or farming sector. I've picked Scotland and the start date in 1224 to illustrate how rich Scotland actually is, as towns like Inverness and Edinburgh actually begin with a massive 7 and 6 towns respectively. In our case, Inverness has a staggering 5 seashore settlements but only 1 farming settlement. Therefore, seeing as we want both food, money, and commerce from our food sector, Going with the harbour is the best choice, and here's the reason. While the harbour building itself does not scale with towns, its upgrades do. This means that upgrading harbours with docks provides us an additional 5 points of food, while upgrading to fish markets later on gives us 5 more commerce. Seeing as our other cities have seashore towns as well, building harbours there will increase this further, especially considering that any upgrades you make to one building is applied to all existing buildings of the same type. A harbour costs about 800 gold and therefore half of our current reserve, but that's more than enough to have some more fun. But first, let's begin with some diplomacy. Seeing as England might be our natural enemy long term, how about we deal with their natural enemy first, France. By establishing a trade agreement, we not only immediately increase the opinion of our merchant class, whose standing and effects you can see up in the top left here, but we also open up the possibility for actual trade relations and money making. You see, trade rights themselves don't do anything, they're only worth something insofar as they allow you to trade. This means we need to look at our royal court. The royal court is basically a council of agents, in the game called knights, and these knights enable many of the game's main mechanics. To begin actually trading with France for example, we need to spend some money to hire a merchant. A merchant may then begin making money from trading with France, by further spending a one-time sum and an upkeep of 10 commerce. This means that about a third of our current commerce is spent trading with France, and so you understand the importance of commerce points. For some extra points, let's use our merchant further by making him a governor. Every city can house a governor as long as you have a knight to govern, but the effects of a governor changes wildly depending on the type of knight. A merchant will for example mean increased commerce, while having a martial rule will see benefits to the army. For now, to develop our realm, it could be wise to make our merchant our governor in Edinburgh as our king is already the governor of Inverness. Alright, let's say you've made it to a point where you feel comfortable enough to go to war with someone. In our case, Galway might be our best bet for our first target. Now there is no way of knowing exactly how many troops your enemy has, 
But seeing as Ganway only has one province, and knowing that that one province has a capacity of 9 workers with no additional levies present, we can get some idea of what we're up against here. Now I must warn you, waging war in this game can be hard and unpredictable, as the enemy knows how to use its levies and forces. With that said, let's do this. As it stands, we have no army. It's easy to tell because we have no martial agent in our royal court, and our king has not been called to arms. In other words, armies must be raised by one of these commanders. But raising soldiers is another thing. Soldiers are recruited in cities. And again, we begin with none. What we do begin with though, are town defenders. A basic mix of troops, and the number available. Since we want to lead an army though, we have to actually recruit new troops. In the beginning, you're likely to not have any barracks at this point, meaning the only squad available to you are peasants. Although they make for poor soldiers are cheap, but demand three whole worker units from the city, taking away a relatively large amount of your economic base, although this remains a small amount. The number of workers will replenish over time by the way, depending on your growth values. Notice also that recruiting peasants does not cost any actual kingdom levies. Kingdom levies are reserved for specialized soldiers, those recruited from a barracks. In this example as Norway, we have built a barracks and upgraded some of its wings, allowing us to recruit units like light infantry, bowmen, and even vikings. Notice how these not just cost more than peasants, but require actual levies to produce, although some of these more professional soldiers only require one worker to recruit. Soldiers are recruited first into your city garrison, but in order to muster them fully, you must first have a marshal in the city, and then drag and drop the various units into the army. You can then leave the city with your army and move as you wish, but remember that armies also require food upkeep, making it important to have both the gold, the food, and the manpower to actually field them effectively. Like we established before, the knights in our royal court are extremely important, and I'll give you another example of this. Before making any rash invasions of foreign countries, it's always wise to place a spy there. A spy can be helpful in many ways, providing you opportunities and advantages you might not even expect. For example, spies might be able to recruit the enemy's marshals and knights, incite revolts, or even help you during sieges by opening the enemy gates. After a war where cities have been conquered, make sure to recruit a cleric and have them adopt a foreign population or pacify them to stop them from rebelling, as this is vital for your kingdom's stability. In this way, knights like spies, merchants, clerics, and diplomats change the tide of history in Knights of Honor 2, especially when you strike. As this is a game taking place in the Middle Ages, we do also have royal marriages here. We can indeed marry off our children to foreign lands and vice versa to create good relations, but since we do not begin with any children, that's not something you need to think about right off the bat. Neither is the matter of the Great Powers and Rankings menu, where you can see the standing of the greatest nations on earth, nor the Kingdom Advantages menu, which provides you with powerful late game bonuses as long as you manage to control the required resources. Kingdoms can also adopt traditions which enable some powerful modifiers, but again, these unlock later after leveling up your knights and spending enough gold and books to enable. These are the most important things you need to be aware of when beginning your game. But of course there's so much more to dive into here. If there's something you're wondering about by the way, consider checking out the royal library in the lower left, which contains a whole ton of important information. If you want even more opinions and thoughts, make sure to check out my full review of the game right here. I really hope this video has helped you somewhat, as I know beginning a grand and brand new strategy game can be daunting, even for the most hardcore veterans. Make sure to leave any questions in the comments, and don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Cheers!